Okay, so we're here now for the last session of the day. We have two more fantastic talks and then a great keynote. So I'm excited to introduce Luis from Intel Labs, who is going to talk about visual data management systems. I'm kind of in the same boat as Moshe. Vishaka was going to give the presentation and she couldn't make it. Um, and just a little bit of background story why we're doing this kind of dual uh, presentation. Essentially, Vishaka and I were working at Intel Labs on this project, the Visual Data Management System, for the last two years or so. And last November, she decided to quit Intel and or she's a startup based on VDMS, so she has that going on right now, and we have been working together the last couple of months on a new release for VDMS, which is an open source project. That's why we keep on working together. And the idea was to present some of the new things that we have going on on VDMS, the new features that we added, some, some of the roadmap. Uh, up to this point, we kind of have the same things, but uh, sadly, uh, at some point, the path will diverge, and I guess we will start getting some new features on the uh, non-open source version of the project. So just a little bit of background for you to know um, why this thing. And maybe let me start by motivation why we started with this project called VDMS, the Visual Data Management System. And we started in the context of um, the visual cloud systems research at Intel Labs, we're thinking about what are the new generations of storage management systems that were going to be needed when you have uh, these visual workloads. And one thing that we realized at that point is most of the applications using um, metadata and visual data to run some processing and, 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 and fuel some applications essentially rely on metadata and visual data at the same time. And the way that they were doing things was uh, on one side they were storing metadata using a relational database or a graph database. Pick whatever flavor you, you want, things that, uh, any other database that are already provided in the cloud. They had a separate service for storing the images that they were running analytics on, such as a regular HTTP server, a distributed file system, or a PAC system. A PAC system is something very specific to storing medical images, for example. But these applications were using these very tailored uh, um, components to, to, to deal with this kind of data, in this case, visual images. In order to run any machine learning over visual data, you essentially have to apply some pre-processing steps first. So they were using OpenCV or even uh, already some of the functionalities that come integrated with TensorFlow or CAFE to run that pre-processing over the images, things like cropping, resizing, flipping, rotating images. And these applications end up looking up like a very big tailor set of scripts that they needed to do all these things and make all these happens. Go check on the database, on the relational database to get some of the metadata that they need or the labels that they need and then go and pick the images and use that and pass that through a neural network then store the results. Maybe run some operations using feature vectors because they extracted that they build an index using some of the in-memory libraries that are, that are out there and then they were throwing away those indexes because uh, they were just rebuilding every time. So. We figured that we needed a, a new solution for this. In a way, uh, a new data management system that was oriented towards visual data in order to unify all these functionalities that are needed and partition in separate tools in a way that it's easy to use, scalable, and not just a set of scripts that if one person no longer maintain them, it becomes really hard to replicate whatever happened there. We also realized that most of our <coughs> workloads were going to be artificial intelligence and machine learning type of workloads. And more importantly, uh, when you have this kind of workloads, you start doing some inferencing. Uh, and your, the amount of metadata that you have or the kind of information that your meta metadata contains evolves over time. So you start with images. Uh, I don't know, with dogs and cats, and then you realize you can have build a new detector where you start getting people and cars, and you want to have a way to store all that metadata information in a way that it's going to evolve easily. So, um, VDMS oriented specifically to handle visual data. And by visual data, I mean, uh, 
both visual, they, both things like images or frames in a video, but also the information that you can extract out, out of those, such as uh, feature vectors that you can you can extract, right? You can uh, run face detection and do feature vector extraction and get that information uh, as part of uh, as part of the application. Um, and things are becoming large scale. They have a lot of information, a lot of metadata. You can make use to refine your models and make uh, the application uh, cover more corner cases. Um, and it's very oriented towards machine learning and, and, and data science uses. But the idea is that VDMS try to address these, these challenges into an integrated solution. So we presented VDMS last year. Um, in this very same venue, we went a little bit deeper on each of the different components that we have. I'm skipping that and just uh, jumping into the main capabilities we have and some of the new features that we have added in the, in the newest release. So for taking care of the metadata, we use uh, one, of the, one of the capabilities VDMS provides is efficient completion of metadata queries. We do that by using a graph database uh, that is optimized for persistent memory. This is a very cool separate project on its own that started at Intel Labs as well and is a design from scratch graph database that it's ACID compliant and it, and it was designed for persistent memory. We are using that because we realized that a graph database was the right answer uh, for storing the type of data that usually comes with uh, visual information, which is highly connected data. Um, the other very big component or capability of VDMS is this ability to uh, efficiently uh, store and retrieve visual data. And by visual data, we have, uh, 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 as of today, we basically support three types of principal uh, visual data, which are images. Images can be stored in regular uh, formats, such as JPEGs, PNGs. You can interact with them. We also design our new format based on an array database that uh, allows uh, operations or pre-processing operations to run much faster. One of those operations that work uh, very much faster than in regular encodings is uh, cropping. Um, I can go into more detail uh, uh, later. But essentially, we enable uh, at query time as you are running queries into VDMS to apply these pre-processing operations such as crop, resize, or basic augmentation operations such as flipping, uh, rotating the images, and, and, and things that are necessary for the pre-processing. We've also added um, the ability to deal with feature vectors or visual descriptors. And essentially, you can create an index of those and start pushing new feature vectors into the, into the database and then run queries that involve doing uh, similarity matching, essentially nearest neighbor search, right? And you can run that nearest neighbor search over a, over a collection of feature vectors that you have stored in a database, and at the same time, run some metadata queries on top of that. And I'm going to be showing you an example later so you understand better what is the idea. But this is a very cool uh, new feature that we have added recently. And we are working now, and we have some basic support on on storing videos directly. Um, essentially, in, in, in the case of videos, we are just providing all the, metadata, all the metadata functionality that we are already providing on top of, and layering on top of operations that are provided by OpenCV or some other library that uh, already uh, solved that problem. The other main thing about VDMS is that we put a lot of effort in having a straightforward client uh, interface and VDMS essentially is a client-server architecture, and we work very hard in making a very consistent and easy-to-use uh, interface in order to interact with the metadata and the visual data that you have stored. We essentially submit queries using JSON, um, and it's very easy to wrap around uh, that in any language that, that you want to create a, the, the, the client side of, of VDMS. Some example of uh, a typical pipeline involving VDMS, and which essentially involves the use of both metadata and, and, and visual data. You have a client that is running some machine learning pipeline or analytics, and you have a server that contains both the metadata and all your visual information in a single place. And through that client, you specify a query to get both metadata and uh, visual data, right? In this example that we have done uh, with respect to 
doing uh, brain tumor segmentation using brain scans. Um, this was essentially the pipeline where we're getting uh, labels and uh, the actual images, passing them through uh, machine learning processing that, that is application specific, and then pushing that data back into VDMS or pushing the result <coughs> of that computation back to VDMS in order to retrieve that later. Um, we recently released a version 2.0 on GitHub, uh, uh, VDMS release 2.0, which added a new, uh, um, a lot of new features with respect to what we presented last year. Um, right now, we support more complex operations over the metadata and, and queries related to uh, both the relationship between the different entities that you can li be living in, in, in your database and, and doing more constrained search uh, in, into that metadata. We support uh, the ability to store and deal with feature vectors, videos, and bounding boxes natively through our interface. Um, and we, we added more uh, operations that were needed for different proof of concepts that we have going on through the, through the year. So all of this is uh, on GitHub right now, so you can just download it, and, and we have Docker images there. You can just download that and start using VDMS right away. One minute. One minute, one minute. all right. So um, one of the latest features that we have added, uh, which we believe is pretty relevant to many of the visual applications that you might have, is the ability to deal with these feature vectors and one of the applications that we have is doing this tracking of people, um, uh, doing multi-tracking through multi-camera. And the way that that use case works, essentially, you can run uh, person detection over the frames, doing feature vector extraction on that, and pushing that into VDMS. And later on, when that person is moving, you can do feature vector extraction again over the person, and in this, uh, this time query whether whether that person exists on your database or not to keep the tracking of, of, of the person. Um, and BDMS can give you the answer for that. So we have implemented all this new functionality and, and we have that running and, and, and going on on the latest um, version of BDMS. And finally, the one thing that we have been working on in the last year is uh, the integration of BDMS with some other components in order to provide a more comprehensive solution when it comes to the processing of visual information from edge to cloud. And we are creating interfaces to uh, integrate BDMS with two other projects that are, uh, one is SAF, which is the streaming analytics framework that came out of CMU, and the scanner project that came out of Stanford. Uh, for doing visual processing, and we're working on on the integration of these and, and applications that that require both components. So, more information here. Uh, last year, we submitted a paper at the Systems for Machine Learning Workshop at NIPS. Um, we have that paper. Um, it has a lot of information about the new features on BDMS and more performance evaluation. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Louis. Thank you. Any questions? Phil. Yeah. How much, if any, of this is done on streaming? That you know, you talk about feature extraction. I can imagine piping that into a SQL-like stream processor and do some filtering on the features in addition to whatever you're doing on the ML pipeline. So uh, it really depends on 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 how you structure the application. But we do have some examples in which we are doing this in a streaming environment. So one uh, project that we have ongoing is using VDMS and one of the other projects for processing streamings, uh, streams of videos in the context of a retail. And we are essentially querying on real-time VDMS to do this feature vector matching to recognize clients or customers that are returning to the store. And that is done as a, as, as, as a video uh, in, in real time. So we can do as fast as the rest of the pipeline is able to process those video streams. That's where most of the challenge is right now. Thanks again, right. Thank Hello. Uh, thanks, Johannes. Um, so as Johannes said, my name is Torsten. I uh, work for Snowflake in product management. And uh, I was talking with Phil about what, what kind of content should I cover in the presentation, going back and forth. And probably the, what we figured out would be the most interesting is to go over some of the kind of main concepts, main techniques that we're using in the core service, in the core engine that sits behind Snowflake. 
Um, if you don't know what is Snowflake, so uh, we are essentially the company that tries to build the data warehouse for the cloud. Founded in uh, 2012, uh, we are headquartered down close to San Francisco Airport in San Mateo. We have uh, development offices up here in Bellevue, Washington, and in Berlin, Germany. Um, I started when the company uh, was uh, just shy of 200 employees two years ago. We are now above 1,000 employees, um, and among those, 150 plus are in core engineering, and obviously we are hiring. Um, our three uh, main founders, two of them, um, Benoit Dajuil and Thierry Kranis, have spent uh, 10, 20 years at Oracle, and then Marcin Sukowski uh, has uh, come from the startup side, Vectorvice, and uh, other places. Uh, for those that are, uh, have been at Microsoft for some time, the name Bob Muglia is probably a familiar one. He's our CEO. Um, we, uh, we went public with the general availability of our service in 2015 um, and uh, uh, since then raised a bunch of money, which is uh, good but also scary. Um, so uh, our product is essentially uh, an elastic data warehouse. Uh, it's a multi-tenant system, transactional, highly secure, and it does not depend on uh, any of the usual suspects in that space, either Postgres or any of the Hadoop systems. So it's uh, built from scratch. Uh, we currently support two cloud providers that we use for both storage and compute, AWS, and uh, since uh, last year, Microsoft Azure as well. We have in the order of six or seven uh, regions built out uh, across the globe. And uh, across all of those, we have in the order of tens of petabytes of customer data that we store running millions of queries from our customers each and every day. Um, our current customer base uh, has about uh, uh, 1,500 customers that are working on the system on a daily basis, and um, that is growing fast. So what are some of the key things that we aspire to? So the first one is we want to provide uh, our data warehouse offering as a cloud service, and probably closest that you can think about this is software as a service. You walk up to something like Salesforce <coughs> as a user, and data warehousing should be as simple as that. Um, in terms of the, the second pillar, then is elasticity. So we want to give you the ability to store, ad, uh, store as much data as uh, uh, you can possibly think, and then put as much analytics and compute on top of that, and scale both of them independently of each other. Um, and third, but not last, we also want to support all kinds of data. So the traditional, relational, structured, table format data, but also semi-structured data that you find uh, in a number of uh, application scenarios. And we want to do that uh, with, with native uh, support in the storage engine. So zooming into the stack at a top level, this is how the Snowflake stack looks like. Um, you can think about it essentially as three layers. At the bottom, you have the storage layer. And there we are just using regular blob storage in the cloud, Azure Blob Storage or S3 for the two cloud, cloud providers that we currently work with. On top of that, uh, customers are running what we call virtual warehouses. So a, a virtual warehouse is essentially a cluster of compute nodes uh, powered by uh, virtual machines in cloud computing that, um, that works with the data uh, that's, uh, that's stored in the storage layer. And then as queries retrieve data, it builds up a cache which sits on the local disks in each virtual warehouse. And uh, as a customer, I can access any data that sits down here given you have the appropriate permissions. Um, and then put as much compute on top of it as you need. So one of the key scenarios that we support is if you have different workloads, for instance, for different departments in your organization, you can give them <laughs> differently sized virtual warehouses that all operate over the same shared data. Um, so at this point in the middle here, this is not multi-tenant, but switching up to the top level, the cloud services up here, which take care of transaction management, uh, query optimization, concurrency control, security, and so on. This is a multi-tenant service uh, that we implement, and that's kind of the front door that every uh, uh, query, every request comes in. Um, so now uh, zooming into uh, the various layers here. So remember these, these three areas here that we talked about. Um, and starting at the bottom, essentially, um, with the storage layer, um, uh, the key here is we are just using regular blob storage in AWS or Azure. It's an object store, key value store. Uh, it's extremely uh, highly available, uh, very durable. Uh, it comes with certain performance penalties uh, from a latency perspective, obviously, because you have to go across the network to, uh, to get your data. 
It's also a append only um, uh, from a workload perspective, so you cannot override an object in place, which has interesting implications. So if you're thinking about OLTP workloads, they're probably not a good fit, but uh, for analytics workloads where you continuously incrementally add uh, data, that's usually a good fit for these kinds of scenarios. Um, and that, you'll see that has a number of implications and also later on as we talk about um, concurrency control. So that's kind of the basic ingredient um, from a storage perspective. The structure that we put on top of that is what we call table files. And uh, we are using a <coughs> columnar representation for the data that goes into a table file. And uh, it's a variation of uh, the PAX model. And um, uh, every table that's stored in Snowflake is horizontally partitioned across a number of these table files. Each table file is roughly 16 megabyte in size. Um, and uses that the columnar um, representation. And then uh, kind of as a side system, independent of uh, the blob storage, the cloud storage, uh, we are using FDB to manage our metadata. And in that FDB system, we are retaining the information which table files belong to uh, what particular table. And as a query comes in, then we touch the metadata that sits, sits in FDB, and we figure out what table version corresponds to what files and then the query uh, goes and, um, and processes those files. Okay, so uh, with that, um, we're moving up one level um, in this stack, and you can see that, at that little icon at the top right. Um, so we're uh, switching over to virtual warehouses. A virtual warehouse, as I mentioned, is essentially just a set of virtual machines uh, in cloud compute. And it's a pure compute resource that uh, is stateless, at least initially until we've built up a cache. And we can size it independently and uh, for even the same data set, we can create as many of these virtual warehouses um, as needed for, for a customer. We can shut them down if the customer uh, is uh, essentially running an, an idle workload. And uh, it comes in various different t-shirt sizes. So essentially an extra small, warehouse maps to a single node, a single VM, and then uh, we can go up to hundreds of VMs all kind of processing in a scale-out fashion to queries that you're sending into them. Um, the user does not necessarily know um, what uh, nodes are being run. All of that is abstracted behind this t-shirt uh, size concept. Um, as I mentioned, um, for performance reasons, we, we hang on to the files to the data that we load from remote storage, uh, so we build up that cache. It's a collection of the table files that we keep locally, um, the table files that we, uh, that we just uh, talked about. What's interesting is that um, uh, the nodes in the same cluster can steal files from each other if they have been loaded into another machine. I can go essentially to my neighbor and ask for data um, that the neighbor may have, but I don't have. Um, Cool. So on these, um, on these virtual machines um, in the virtual warehouse, we are running the a core execution engine. And for, for all intents and purposes, it just purely focuses on processing queries. Uh, remember, all the query optimization, all the transaction management, all the security is done at the top level, at the global services level. And I want to call out a few of the uh, kind of key ideas that are at play here. So um, as you probably figured from uh, the, the table file structure, uh, we are using a columnar uh, processing approach here, uh, like MonoDB or C-Store. Um, and, and, and that gives us uh, a good baseline for performance. Marcin Sikowski is one of our founders, so don't be surprised if you see vectorized query processing show up here as well. So uh, we are making use of that. Um, we're not using Volcano iterators, so we're using a push-based approach that's, uh, that's based on uh, Neumann. Um, and that works pretty well, at least in, uh, in, our, um, in our case. So, and uh, as I mentioned, no transaction management is done at, at this level. That's all taken care of at uh, the top level. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, most of the operators try to leverage and do as much as possible in, in memory, but they have the ability to, to spill to disk, to the local disks on the machines, or even uh, S3 or, or Azure Blob Storage if that is needed. Mm -hmm. So moving up uh, to the top level here, so that's the cloud services level, uh, how we call it. It's a collection of different services, um, access control, security, query optimization, concurrency <coughs> control, transaction management. That's, uh, that's really the first place where 
our system is multi, truly multi-tenant. The virtual warehouses uh, that do the query execution, they're all dedicated to a specific <coughs> tenant, to a specific customer. Um, and um, the, uh, obviously that, the, the multi-tenancy brings a number of interesting challenges for us, so we have to make sure it's secure, that every tenant is sandboxed, uh, that's highly available, uh, it could be a single point of failure. So all of these aspects are just amplified for us in, uh, in this cloud services uh, uh, level. And that's also the place where we then heavily interact also with this metadata store that I mentioned. It has all the knowledge about um, the files um, uh, and, their, and their content. So let's start with uh, concurrency control. Um, two of our founders are coming from Oracle. So you shouldn't be uh, uh, too surprised if, you are, if you're seeing a, a multi-version concurrency control approach that's being applied here using snapshot isolation. So all concepts very, very similar to, uh, to what you will find um, in, in Oracle. That also is very natural for us. Um, if you think about the file-based approach, um, it's very easy for us to think about snapshots essentially as versions of a table, where each version of a table is a re represented by a set of files that are accurate for a table at any given point in time. And that then allows us to point an incoming query to a very specific set of files which then implements a, a version um, of a table. Um, it's also very handy if you, for instance, want to do uh, uh, cloning for tables. It's a metadata-only operation. Um, and you can also then offer things like time travel that we, that we heard before um, by going back to previous versions of, uh, of a table. Yep. Uh, so in terms of uh, query processing, probably the key aspect that I want to mention here is the ability to, to, bro to prune. So um, what's the fastest way to process data? Um, and what I uh, say is, yeah, don't process it in the, in the first place. Um, so um, uh, the idea here is to figure out uh, for any incoming query, what data do I actually need to touch to provide you with a correct and accurate result to the query? In order to do that, uh, we are not relying on indexes because that typically has a big burden for users because they have to decide which indexes to create and then we have to maintain them. What we're doing instead is as data is being loaded, we're extracting metadata and statistics for the incoming uh, uh, table files and we're retaining that in our metadata. As a new query comes in, then we look at that metadata and decide whether a particular table file may qualify for the query or not. And if it doesn't qualify, then we're pruning that from, uh, from the processing. And you can see there are a number of different statistics that we're retaining in the metadata to do this, uh, this kind of pruning. So with, with all of this, uh, uh, um, what are the ongoing challenges for us? Um, obviously, scale is a big topic for us. So we, uh, we have to uh, go into additional uh, regions across the globe to meet our customers wherever they are. Um, the customer data is increasing. The metadata is growing. So scale and managing scale is a big, big topic for us. We need to wrap our head around serverless computing. Uh, low latency streaming data ingestion is, uh, is a topic that's interesting to us as well. Um, then something fairly unique which we offer is the capability to share data and collaborate over data. So that's an uh, investment, big investment area for us. But besides that, that there, there's just typical traditional database work that needs to be done across the stack. Um, and with that, uh, let me wrap it up. Thanks very much. Okay. Questions for Torsten? Uh, what is the version ID for your MMCC, and how do you ensure that uh, you have the uh, you have the correct you have the matching version IDs across tables? How do we make sure? So this 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 is timestamp based. Essentially, you're getting a timestamp on the different tables, and a and a table version for for a given table is represented by a timestamp. So if you, if you come in and you, you run a query, it's essentially you're getting whatever is read committed um, on, that, uh, on that particular table. But different tables will have different time because of the time, because of clock trip, and then that may, you may not be able to have the correct snapshot. Well, that remember that the metadata is maintained in FDB, which, which is fully transactional. So even if your transaction is maintaining or updating multiple tables, <coughs> There's a, there's a single transaction that goes into, into our metadata store so that you can attach the same timestamp to all of the uh, tables that are touched by uh, a given transaction. Thank you. Anil. So what do you mean that multi-tenancy, lack of multi-tenancy other layers? Like virtual warehouse is 
per tenant. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, is, he, is a virtual warehouse VMs, per tenant. So are dedicated to a tenant. That, that's correct. So uh, a customer actually goes in and, and says, I want to, for this particular workload, I want to run or I want to back this by the following set of resources that can be a, uh, a single cluster of machines, but the cluster can also scale to multiple clusters for high concurrency uh, scenarios. Um, and then that set of resources is dedicated to that particular customer, okay. which is not the case for the top level. Yeah. Phil? Do you, for, the, for the, those, those um, virtual warehouses, do you do SLA-based uh, pricing and then elastic scale-in and scale-out <coughs> under some price envelope, or is this much more static? At this point, it's fairly static. We'd love to get into, um, I'd say, a more dynamic model here where essentially you throw a query at us and we figure out how much resources um, do, you, uh, do you need for that, maybe given some pricing constraints or some performance aspirations. Uh, that's not something that we do uh, yet at this point automatically. Last question. So you said in your vectorized execution you use push. How does it work for joints for you? That's a great question. I don't know uh, from the top of my head. Um, that's something I would, would, uh, would get you in touch with Marcin or, or Allison from our SQL team. Okay, let's thank Torsten again. Thank you. Okay, we come to our last event of the day, um, the closing keynote by Donald and Arvind. In terms of quick introduction, Donald is currently the director of MSR Redmond. He used to be professor at ETH and recently moved to MSR maybe three, four years, three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, Arvind is a researcher in the database group here who has widely published um, across a variety of issues such as database security, data speed processing, and so on. And um, they're going to talk about um, overlaying through the database applications over blockchain. So it has one of the recent passwords in it. Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So usually uh, uh, the last speaker is the la is I'm between you and dinner or something really great, right? Um, I'm now between you and chaos, right? So wh whatever that means, whether this is, makes it even worse, I, I know that you cannot wait until you can park your car on 148th Avenue. Um, but uh, so I'll, I'll try to get you there uh, to your traffic jam as fast as possible. So. Um, so we're, I'm going to talk about blockchains, which is kind of like uh, cooling down a little bit. So maybe this is a, a good moment in time to, to reflect and step a, a little bit back. And what I, I will present you is a little bit our point of view, um, not necessarily Microsoft's point of view, but Microsoft research or of one particular project, Veritas, that uh, we've been working on um, in this space. So maybe the most important slide is this slide. Um, and that is, what is it that we want to achieve with blockchain? Or why are we interested in blockchain? So blockchain does many things, right? And, um, and, and that's going to be a, a, an important part of this talk, kind of factoring out the things that we believe are useful and the things that we believe are less useful, and then uh, somehow packaging them together. So I... Um, what we believe is why blockchain is great is because it provides you proof of something that you have done or that somebody else has done. Yeah? And um, so it's a proof of, uh, that something happened in the digital world. Another way to look at it is blockchain is in some way um, uh, electronic or digital form of a witness. Yeah? So in the real world, proof is, well, if I... If I promise you I'm going to pay you a beer, right, um, then you probably are going to hold me accountable for it and you're going to use everybody else as witness and you're going to say, well, Donald really said that, yeah? And that's uh, what you're going to, going to use to kind of make sure that I really pay the beer, yeah? So um, in the real world, proof and witnesses are a normal thing and they happen all the time and that's why uh, we believe it's also a concept that is very useful in the digital world. And blockchain is, a, is a, a component, a technology component that does it. And that's what we're going to talk about. So just to, to give this perspective why this is useful, why witnesses are useful, 
Essentially, everything that you do in the real world, or a lot of things that you do in the real world, require proof. Yeah? So, um, I'm married, and with that, I kind of, I sometimes say, tell my wife, yeah, we are married, you should be nice to me, right? And, uh, and I can prove that, uh, because, yeah, I, we have a certificate, actually, I, I don't have a ring anymore because I lost it, but, uh, uh, but that's, that is often the... And you have witnesses like the best man. What we'll also see is a kind of simple um, um, examples like, like uh, um, buying alcohol. I'm always very proud when, when, I, when I go into a bar and people ask me for my driver's license. It unfortunately doesn't happen that often. But uh, in the digital world, as we will see, it's, it's not that easy to prove that you're 18 years old and that you can buy alcohol on the web. Right? This is something where you want to provide proof. In the real world, we've, we, we have things, and Arvin is going to tell, uh, talk about the digital form of a driver's license. Um, we have these artifacts to provide proof, and this is exactly what we want to do in the, uh, in the digital world now. So why do we want to, and why is this coming up now? Yeah? And uh, this is essentially because of the, the cloud era, right? In the old era, and I'll, uh, as a next, I'll give another example just to, to put it into perspective. In the PC world, right, when you were kind of alone on your PC and you were playing Pac-Man, right, you were not really, you didn't really need proof. Yeah? If you got a new high score in Pac-Man, maybe you wanted to kind of uh, uh, show off at, uh, um, at work and say, I got a new high score. And usually you did that by taking a, a screenshot. But... On the PC, in the old PC area, when you were alone and you were the only person kind of curating your data, um, proof was not that important. But now we, li we live in the cloud world where, and we live in the connected world where people collaborate. Yeah, where people, and I'm going to use Excel as a next, uh, in the next slide, where people collaborate to, to produce content. And then, indeed, you want to have Proof you want to know where data comes from uh, and, and that's because you make decision based on the data that is that you're you're looking at. So let me just give a small example of our favorite database here at Microsoft, um, Excel. Yeah, and so again in the old world you you typed in your data and you trusted yourself and you you trusted wh wh what you want to do. But in the new world. This Excel spreadsheet, the information might come from different sources. So let's assume you're Britney Spears, and you're interested to, to find out who are you going to date tonight, right? And, um, and so you have this spreadsheet, and, and uh, if you're Britney Spears, you might want to be interested to know where this information comes from, in particular, of course, this age information, because, of course, you, want to, you don't want to date any of those really old guys, right? <laughs> and so for Britney Spears, it might be interesting to, to know that two of these kind of ages, they come from, from Bing, and one comes from, uh, from wishful thinking. So this is really what we're talking about here, and this is where we want to kind of get blockchain. And, and in some sense, this is a database. Yeah? So essentially, what the, the goal of what we're trying to achieve and how, why we're using these technologies, the goal is really that we want to automate this, this kind of generating proofs. And of course, there's no proof here that Tom Cruise is 55. The proof is this information came from Bing. And what we want to generate a proof for is that this information came from, um, from ritual thinking or manual entry. Yeah? And so the, 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 the bottom line of this is that blockchain is actually a very nice building block of generating these proofs and with these proofs essentially trust, um, but it is not enough. Yeah? And, because, and, and the way, um, and this is kind of the, the message here, the way blockchain is packaged today is, is, um, is not the right way, right? So, uh, and the project and really what we're working on is about repackaging it in a form that we actually get this proof without reinventing everything else and reinventing the world. Okay, so what is this talk going to do uh, once we're done? And here is chaos, here's traffic jam down here. 
Um, so I'll give you a very brief, I assume most of you know what blockchain is, but I, I still want to kind of introduce sort of, uh, the very basic concepts of blockchain So because we're going to decompose it and recompose it again. So I'll do that at the beginning. Then I'll tell you a little bit how kind of the blueprint, how we are repackaging it. And actually, the more interesting thing is, because this is all very abstract, is Arvind is then going to tell you about one kind of very fairly sophisticated system that we, have, um, that we implemented with this, uh, with this blueprint, let's put it that way. Um, and that is a system called decentralized ID. It's, it's actually a standard, but that is actually doing something really useful. Yeah, this is, think of it as replacing a uh, login with Facebook uh, with something that you can control and uh, the, that, um, that is totally distributed and, and open. Okay, does that sound like a good plan? Yeah? Now is a good uh, moment to, to stop me. <laughs> okay, so switching back into, into kind of cruise mode. Um, so... This is, this is what blockchain is. Again, I, I assume that most of you uh, know and what it is, but it is essentially two concepts which are coupled together. And the first concept is where all the crypto is, is, uh, is making things immutable. Yeah? So once you've done something, a transaction, I'll just give a, a small example of that, nobody can change it anymore. And the second thing is, is this concept of a witness that I said before. Um, technically, what it is, is it's a consensus protocol. And of course, that's where all the variety is. And when you, when you look at all the innovation, there are gazillions of different consensus protocols with, uh, with different properties and scalability cost and so on, scalability in the number of users versus scalability in the number of transactions and the, and the size of the data. Um, and that's where all these differences is. And these two are kind of baked together. Yeah? And as I will argue that this baking these two things together, that's what makes it actually work in blockchain, but it's actually not needed. And uh, the main um, message that I'm giving is if you kind of decouple the two, yeah, then actually you can, you can achieve pretty much the same guarantees and this proof guarantees, but you can integrate it in a, in, a, in, a, in a better way. So, for example, for consensus, and uh, uh, we database people have, have, have also a, a good story. And so if you want to use your, your, your database system kind of to order transaction, you can use it. Whereas in blockchain, essentially this ordering of transactions is baked into the consensus protocol, which is for database people not the best thing to do. Okay, so these are the two concepts baked together, and I'll just uh, show this through an example, how this is exposed, um, and, 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 and uh, I think everybody understands that. So Amy is actually our Microsoft uh, Chief Financial Officer, and Harry is kind of the big shepherd, Harry Shum, of, uh, of Microsoft Research. And so let's say you have kind of... Uh, um, um, uh, the situation is that Amy has 70 million bitcoins and Harry has 50 million bitcoins, and then Amy gives Harry 20 million bitcoins, and because Harry was so great, in the next step, Amy gives Harry 30 million bitcoins. So at the end, Amy will have uh, 20 million and Harry will have 50 million. And the problem that blockchain addresses, and that's the first thing, is uh, with the immutability is, well, let's say Harry just kind of because he has access, this is, lives in the cloud, and this is just data in the cloud, and Harry is kind of smart, and he kind of uh, uh, got hand of a copy of this data where this is stored, and he changes the 20 to the 50. And the problem is, at this point, and in this situation, nobody, neither Amy can prove that this was a 20, nor Harry can prove that this is a 50. Yeah? There's no information, there's nothing there, right? And that's the problem that blockchain addresses, yeah? And so how does it address it? And this is exactly these two things baked together. It addresses it by, uh, by having witnesses, yeah? 
And uh, these witnesses in the in the Bitcoin uh, blockchain are, is just the the whole community uh, of everybody around. And what do these bit uh, these witnesses keep? They essentially keep a picture, a photo, or a thumbnail of what you want to do of the of the head of the blockchain. And every block in the blockchain keeps a picture <coughs> of the previous block. Yeah. And uh, this is how blockchain works. So now if uh, if Harry kind of uh, messes around with this uh, picture, essentially this picture, this thumbnail or this hash of this block, they, they will not match anymore. And at this point, everybody will know that this is not the right version of the block. Yeah. And so in some sense, Her uh, Amy, if she has the old version of this or the correct version of this, she can prove that these two match. And, ha and Harry will not be able to create <coughs> this proof. Again, creating proof for transactions, that is what we, uh, that's what we are interested in here. Okay, of course, uh, Harry might be smart and might want to also kind of change this picture so that it matches here. But in this case, then the the witnesses and their copy, it, the, this, this block will, will not match the picture of the, the block that the, that the witnesses have or the hash of that. Okay? And this is how this is called. Okay, I think everybody understands this and this is all well known. So now let's step back as database people. Um, this is our traditional world. We have an application, we have a database system, and we read and write using SQL into that database system. And this is the world we love, and I think most of the day we've heard about this world. And this is now the new world that I just described here, and you can, of course, build applications on top of that, and that's a, a little bit what we are interested in, and we will show one of these example applications. But now, if you look at it, our, uh, our API has changed. Our API is not, well, SQL, and you, you might want to make it SQL, but there are some, some, some more fundamental thing. The, the update in place or update doesn't exist anymore. Right? And it's fundamental that the update doesn't exist. Now you can say, well, we've heard in, in uh, and I, I think Moshe has said, well, you don't update either, right? You, you just append. But in some sense, logically, you still have an update. Right? Here that doesn't exi exist, it's read and append, and it is, the abstraction is that of a ledger. It's not of that of a table. Right? But you have something else that is very important. You have a verify operation. Create a proof. Yeah? Create a proof that this uh, transaction Amy gave uh, Harry 20 exists. <coughs> and you can do that in this world, but you cannot do that in this world. At least not in our SQL databases that we have today. Yeah. So you have this kind of great kind of creating proof property here, and, uh, and you have uh, the great kind of productivity, performance, also all the other kind of uh, um, things. This is a very well-established uh, uh, um, um, ecosystem and very well-optimized and, and, and well-tested uh, and, and robust uh, environment. So the goal that we essentially have is that we want to combine the two. And this is what I will show you kind of one way how to do that at a very schematic way, but then the, the more interesting way is how this is working in a very large scale uh, system and Arvind will tell you about that. So essentially what we want to achieve is that your application is pretty much unchanged. Yeah? You still use SQL, you still use the same abstractions that, that we have to build these, abstract, uh, the, these applications, and you also want your database system to perform in the same way. You want to have the same availability, you want to see, have the same durability, you want to have the same performance uh, guarantees, you want to use B-trees, um, if that is what you, what you love, um, um, to index the data. But then on the other hand, you want to, and this is the kind of uh, the idea here, is you want to still have this verify uh, uh, functionality. You still want to be able to create proofs. And this is what we want to achieve. And I'm going to give you a very, for the next three minutes before uh, Arvind comes, I'm going to give you a, a kind of a, a blueprint of how this can be done. And of course, the technical details are a little bit more complicated, but essentially, you should get from this blueprint also a feeling of uh, that this actually does work and is possible. 
So here's the idea. I'll, I'll, I'll skip kind of the, the, essentially the idea is to decouple the witnessing and the immutability. Yeah? And so um, I'll just explain this. So again, you have Amy, you have your database with your balances, with your, with your balances. Amy has 70 and Harry has 50. And again, your goal is you want, to, you want to kind of do these transactions in the traditional way using SQL. You want them to perform as, as before, but you want to be able to create proofs on the side. And the way to do that is, okay, Amy does this transaction again in the same way as she did before. And then what you do is you start creating essentially this blockchain or this tamper-proof log or how you wanna, wh however you want to call it. You enter this Amy, this transaction into there, and, uh, but you don't kind of verify just at this point yet. Right? Um, you put it there, but what you also give, you give Amy a receipt. And that's the kind of the idea because this receipt is important. Um, if this receipt is lost, in some sense, Amy will not be able to later prove that anything has happened here in the blockchain. Yeah? So you give this receipt, and this is essentially to make sure that this database that you don't trust, here you don't trust anything that is in this cloud. Right? All of this can be none, and even this component that creates this cryptographic hashes here, um, and again, those are the details you have to look into the paper, um, um, that can all be uh, hacked and fraud with, but Amy can, can at least verify that this receipt matches to her, uh, to her transaction. So you do this and you operate this, and this is the only additional overhead that you have in the inner loop. And, and that's fairly cheap. You create these cryptographic hashes. And of course, you have to log everything. And you log, essentially, while you log, you create this, these, uh, these blockchains with the, with, the, with the secure hashes that they are not uh, uh, tampered with. And so what does Amy do with this? And she does that asynchronously. She gives this receipt to her witnesses. And again, I'm not saying anything here about permission blockchain or public blockchain. The blueprint sh should be general and independent of that. <coughs> so this would work for here. This is maybe a more kind of private environment where the, uh, uh, Terry is one of the board members of, uh, uh, of Microsoft, where there's kind of a, a closed set of witnesses. But this could also be an open set of witnesses where you just publish your receipt and uh, put it on some kind of uh, BitTorrent protocol to, to, to disseminate it. Yeah? And so with these receipts, now these witnesses, and again, of course, these don't have to be people. Those are agents that can run anywhere. This could run in the Amazon cloud, and this could be in the Microsoft cloud or the other way around. Um, they can now verify with these receipts that everything here happens. And the beauty of this kind of architecture is, uh, first of all, this is asynchronous. It doesn't, doesn't interrupt in the thing, and it's very flexible. You can, you can decide only to verify when something bad happens. And if never anything bad happens, you never pay the price for it. Yeah? But if something bad happens, you always have everything that you need, um, all these receipts or whatever you want to prove that something went wrong. And uh, I'll just give some very simple examples. Let's say uh, um, um, Harry wants to change this, and of course the receipts will not match here, and this will be caught. But also what will be caught is if, um, if Harry changes something here. If he says, well, no, I, I have actually 100 million, uh, 100 million bitcoins, and if he changes that, um, actually that will be caught at some point when, um, when Amy actually reads, starts reading this, at, at the point where this will be read, actually that will, uh, reads will also create receipts, and at that point the receipts um, um, that are created here will not match again. Okay, so that's the blueprint, and essentially the bottom line is that there's a there's an very important technology building block it's just packaged in the wrong way. And with that, I want to give it to Arvind to kind of go through a fairly sophisticated system that was essentially built with this kind of mindset in mind. So 
can people hear me? <coughs> so thank you, Donald, and uh, thank you, Johannes, for the introduction. So I'll be talking about one of the, uh, a, a very concrete example of some of the ideas that uh, Donald mentioned. So, and in this case, you'll see that for one particular application, uh, uh, application space, you, uh, we'll see how we can overlay uh, an existing system on top of blockchains to, to achieve like verifiability guarantee. So you can verify whether who is doing what, and if something goes wrong, you can, you can find out like what was the reason for it, right? So, okay, so, so I start off with this very famous, and I should mention that a lot of these ideas, we worked with other people in other parts of Microsoft from the identity team. Uh, I should, uh, yeah, it's mentioned here. Anyway, so we'll, st we'll start off with this very famous cartoon. So in this cartoon, it says that you have this couple of dogs, and one of them says, on the internet, you can do anything, like no one knows you're a dog. But sometimes we want to know that you're a dog. So for example, it might be ordering some pet supplies or something that you actually want to know it's a dog, right? So, so like, j jokes apart, like one of the, uh, like what, like one of the problems uh, that we have is, uh, the identity is a fundamental notion on the web. Right, so for many of the examples that uh, Donald mentioned earlier, uh, I want to show that I'm above a certain age, uh, therefore I can have alcohol. So we need to like make facts about ourselves, and in in a digital world, we need to be able to do it in a formal sense. We we want to show that this is actually the case, right? So a central notion for many of these things, the witnesses, ideas, is 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 an idea of an identity, right? Like more formally, what is identity, right? So like my identity, for example, is it consists of my personal information, my name, my uh, age, the date of birth, and in information about which country I belong to, my citizenship, uh, and education, occupation skills, uh, and so on, right? And what is identity problem, much more formally? The, the identity problem for uh, is basically uh, it, it's, it's a problem of coming up with mechanisms to show like certain attributes about myself to a variety of systems. So for example, when I, when I enter the country, I need to be able to show that I'm a citizen of this country. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I use my car, I need to be able to show that I have, the I have the requisite driving skills to use my car. I'm not so sure about this weather though, but in general, uh, I have that. And, and, and the second problem over this identity is the, uh, the, the above mechanisms should also ensure that it should not be possible for someone else to impersonate me uh, as far as his identity is concerned. Like, like someone else should not pretend that he or she is Arvind and then impersonate me, right? So we want to ensure these two properties. One is we want to show that we are us and we have these properties and then we want to avoid others from impersonating me. So if you observe what's happening online, uh, like how is this problem being solved today, right? So, so what we have now is not one identity system, but we have a whole patchwork of systems, right? Uh, and some of the identities are like your license, your passport, these are like physical artifacts that are issued by, say in this case, the US government. And you also have identities like your IDs, in the, your login IDs in LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and the banks, and so on, right? So uh, essentially, uh, and, and then if you, if, if you look at these identifiers on the left, these are all like online identifiers, which means that they're essentially a password uh, and a username. Uh, and and basically put together, they try to solve the problem that I mentioned earlier, right? So for example, when I enter the country, I can show my password, uh, I can show my passport to enter this building, I have a badge, and so on and so forth. And also notice that many of these identities also rely on this physical documents like the university that you went to, you, it might issue a physical diploma and so on, right? So we can use this mishmash of technologies to show certain properties about ourselves that I went to, a, I have this education, I have the skills, and so on and so forth. Um, but but it comes with a whole a whole set of problems. So like, what are the problems? So first of all, I don't own any of these identifiers that are issued by the system. I can't generate a new identifier if I want to. I need to rely on some other system to generate the identifier for me. So I don't own any of these things, and and because. I rely on existing systems. Often these existing systems have centralized root of trust. So all the identifiers that we have today, uh, they rely on centralized root of trust. So if I need an identity from Google, I am, I'm trusting Google to, to manage the identity for me. And because it is like centralized, it's not universally accepted. So Microsoft is not gonna accept an identity from Google and vice versa. So, so like what happens of this is because of, because of this is we have the problem that we have a whole whole set of identifiers, and which increases the management complexity uh, because of that. Anyone can identify with the problem of managing hundreds of logins and you know passwords for all these logins and so on. And, 
And also the identifiers that we have today, the identity, the, the notions of identity that we have today are, are non cryptographic, which means that uh, I cannot I cannot formally show some property about myself. So these are not rooted in cryptography, but in a variety of ad hoc mechanisms. And in particular, this makes it very easy to, for someone to impersonate me, right? For any of these identifiers, if I lose my my password and log, uh, like login name and and potentially some attributes about myself, like someone else can impersonate me very easily, right? And also this non cryptographic nature makes it easy, to, uh, it, it makes it hard to, to, to achieve privacy. So for example, if I want to show that I'm a boy at a certain age, I'll show what do I do today. I'll show my license. But the license contains a variety of other information, like my residence, which I don't want to reveal. I just want to reveal that I'm over 21, right? I don't want to reveal my exact date of birth, my residence, and, and so on and so forth. It's very hard to achieve with the existing systems. OK. so. In the rest of the talk, I want to argue, I want to basically speak about one idea, the idea about uh, decentralized identifiers. And essentially, it, it, the vision of these identifiers is that it's a self-owned identity, which is owned by you, which can be used to securely and privately store all elements of your identity and all attributes about yourself, right? So let me unpack this statement for you, right? So first of all, such an identity uh, is decentralized. It's not relying on like Microsoft or any particular organization to keep a service up and running for you to produce an identity and then uh, and so on, right? And anyone can, uh, the vision is that anyone can construct an identity and use it. And the second uh, issue is that the, 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 the second aspect is that because there's no centralized root of trust, it's completely decentralized, it potentially like, it, uh, it has a potential to minimize the need for a large number of so like separate identif uh, identifiers, right? So this is a vision. So because it's, it, it is, it's completely non-centralized, it can be universal, and everyone can accept this uh, vision. And, and in fact, I want to argue that the vision that I laid out is not a vision that is specific to Microsoft. It's not a vision that we came up with. It's a vision that is part of an organization called Decentralized Identity Foundation. And a whole bunch of companies are already part of this organization, including Microsoft and IBM and a whole bunch of companies. And I think the last time I checked, Facebook and Google were not there, but a whole bunch of companies are there. And also, as we will see uh, with an example, that the identity that we have here is cryptographic, which means that we can use protocols uh, cryptographic protocols for authentication and establishing uh, claims uh, as an example, right? Okay, so, oops, the animation is not right. Okay. Okay, so the, 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 so this idea of decentralized ID that I presented itself uh, is, is, is a very high level uh, specification that is there in the organization. But what we are doing in Microsoft is to produce a specific protocol that conforms to the high level specification. And in this example, in this running example, I will, I will basically flesh out what the protocol looks like and how it can be used to address like some of the problems that we mentioned earlier. So as I mentioned earlier, like, uh, and in fact, the <coughs> protocol that we are building is called Cytri. Uh, it's an internal name. Uh, it's, it's not, okay. So anyway, uh, so Citri is a P2P protocol, uh, which means that anyone can run a Citri node. And, uh, as, and this protocol itself uh, is not, it's a second level protocol, which means that it is kind of built on top of an existing blockchain, like a Bitcoin. Uh, so in this case, all the orange nodes are the Citri nodes, and the Bitcoin network is like shown in blue. Uh, and any two Citri nodes are essentially communicating with each other using the Bitcoin network. So, and which means that all the Citri information that we'll see will basically be, uh, will be serialized as, as part of the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin type of flock. So, so we have a user, Alice, who comes along. Alice wants to generate an ID. So basically she contacts one of the, like one of her fa favorite Citri nodes. She could run a node by herself and she asks a, uh, she asks a node to generate an ID. And as part of that process, she also generates a private key for herself and a public key which she gives as part of this operation. So what the system does is it, it, it constructs a unique identifier for Alice and it associates the public key of Alice with this unique identifier. And the fact that <coughs> Alice's identifier and the public key is basically the, so it is basically embedded, anchored in the blockchain. So at some location in the blockchain, there will be an, a transaction which records the fact that uh, the, you have a particular ID and the ID has a particular public key associated with this. Right? So this information is in the blockchain. And because, blockchain, because of the blockchain consensus mechanism, 
every blockchain node is aware of this information, which means that every Cytri node on the universe will know, will have a consistent view of the information that this is an ID and this is a public key associated with this ID. Arvind, at this point, Alice can, can lie about her age. Right, we'll get to that. That's exactly my example later, right? So yes, at some point, <coughs> oh, for some reason, my Alice, my animation is all screwed up. Sorry about that. So at some point, Alice can come and say, hey, this is my ID, and she can do an update operation. And she can come and say, my name is Alice, uh, and, and this is my date of birth. And again, the system would blindly accept it, assuming that any such update has to be signed with her private key, which means that you and I cannot, if we are not Alice, uh, unless because we don't possess the private key, we cannot do the update. But Alice can certainly do the update, and she can say anything about herself, and, and that information would be also kind of like, you know, eventually anchored in the blockchain, right? So this would, this would all be fine. As, uh, Tan mentioned it's not very interesting for a user to make statements about uh, herself. I can say anything about myself, and as I said, you can say you're 28, and you know, uh, so that information will be there. But where the system becomes interesting is that if we kind of, uh, uh, so, like, when it becomes interesting is that if we introduce network effects. So if everyone is part of the system, so imagine that you have organization, you have banks, you have, uh, you, you, so your licensing office all becomes part of this thing, and then you have, say, and then you start making statements about itself, uh, each other, it becomes very interesting. So as a running example, like we'll, we'll augment Alice with University of Washington. Let's say University of Washington also becomes part of the system, it gets its own ID, and then at some point this, this licensing department gets its own ID, and then now if you assume that Alice goes to UW and gets a computer science degree, she can go to UW and say, so this is my ID, and what UW would do is it basically, it would attest the fact that she has a computer science degree from UW, and basically it would sign with its private key, and, and such a document, it can basically release that document to Alice. And now what Alice can do is like she can update her ID information with the fact that she has this document, uh, so, so, so she has this uh, diploma from UW, and that information can also go to blockchain. At this point, you can say, and, and, and likewise, right? She can go to the licensing office, she can show that she can drive, and she'll get a license, and, and that information would also go to the blockchain. At this point, you can come and say, hey, but blockchain is public information. Why are we putting all this information in the blockchain? And the answer to that is, we don't have to put all this information. What we can do is we can, we can basically anchor a hash of this information in the blockchain, so, but Alice can retain ownership of all this information. So she has this license, but the hash of this license go to the blockchain, which means that at some level, because the hash has this one-way property, she is committing herself to having this document, but you don't need to put the document in the blockchain. Right? So essentially, it is like putting that information in the blockchain, but without any other privacy concerns. Right. So again, this is a very high-level view. One of the properties of, uh, like, like one of the innovations of the Cytree uh, protocol itself is how to make this efficient. I won't be talking about it. If anyone who knows Bitcoin knows that its transaction rate is like one transaction per second, and that is totally a non-starter if you can only do one transaction per second. Essentially, we have ideas for, we are for combining multiple transactions as one Bitcoin transaction, and therefore we can achieve much higher rates than what Bitcoin supports. Anyway, so we'll look at how this system can be used to show proofs, right? Uh, we are, at the end of the day, we are interested in proofs. So, so let's assume that Alice goes to a bar, and she wants to convince Bob the barman that her age is about 21. So she goes and says that, hey, this is my ID, right? So she gives the ID to Bob. Bob and what he can do is he, uh, he so he can run his own Cytree network, or he can go to such like uh, he can go to some Cytree node and say uh, like what is the public key of this DID? And because this information is consistent, every Cytree node has a consistent view of this of the universe. Uh, he gets Alice's public key that was registered when she generated the DID, right? So so that information he gets access to this document with Alice's name and so on. And, and if you observe, yeah, I've actually embedded a hash of her license, so he gets a hash of her driver's license as well, <coughs> right? So, and then what happens, so he's still not convinced that he's talking to Alice, because it could be anyone who is, this IDs are public information at some level, right? So anyone could be s s saying they're Alice. So he says, hey, I'm not convinced that you're Alice, so uh, I want you to show that you're Alice, and this is like fairly standard, cryptography, uh, he basically, uh, he, he constructs a random string, and he requires Alice to sign the random string with her private key, and assuming that only Alice has possession of the private key, so Alice would be able to sign and authenticate herself uh, to, that she is Alice. 
right? And at that point, he knows that he's talking to Alice. He has access to the Alice public key. He can verify the signature using the public key. And he also has the hash of our, of our license. At that point, Alice can go and forward our license to Bob. Uh, and, and he can verify that he, uh, that Alice indeed has a license and she's about 21 years. Uh, and, and to verify that, he can also do the, the same step again because Alice's license is like, is like signed by another entity. The, the licensing department, he can go to Citri and get the information from Citri and verify that the license is valid. So everything is well, uh, works. So in fact, we can even go further. I'm not going to speak about it. We can use some ideas from like zero knowledge proof to not reveal the entire license to Bob, but only reveal the fact that Alice's age uh, is about 21, but let's not get into those details. Okay, so, okay. so at this point, what I had is a very simple toy example of how we can show some facts uh, in the system, uh, but then we'll consider, like, like, like one of the visions that we laid out earlier in this presentation is that we can retrofit a lot of this verifiability to existing platforms. So in this case, I want to consider platforms uh, called OpenID. OpenID is a pretty well-known standard and a lot of identity providers like Google Identity Provider and Active Directory, they kind of rely on this OpenID protocol for identity. And how does open ID, uh, ID protocol works? So again, we have Alice, and Alice says, so in this open ID protocol, essentially we have an ID provider. This is a system like Active Directory or uh, Google ID provider, and Alice would have an account with such an ID provider. And this ID provider would have information about Alice that Alice can access this machine, she can access this printer, and she has all these credentials. And what Alice would do is whenever she wants to access any resource, and in this case, in, in, in the, in the OpenID protocol like language, any resource that she wants access, any website that she wants access is called the, this relying party. So what Alice would do is she would first contact the ID provider and authenticate herself using, again, this is not with the new ideas. This is, this is how the world works today, right? She would authenticate herself with the ID provider uh, with a username, password, or multi-factor authentication, whatnot, right? At that point, if the ID provider is convinced that it is indeed Alice, what the ID provider will do is it will generate a token, uh, and, and this token has protections, and Alice would basically be able to forward the token to another like relaying party, and, and this relaying party knows at this point that this is Alice, and then, uh, and then, and, and, and then let her use the services. So like, what's the problem with this, right? It's, we have the same kind of problem that we mentioned earlier. So this relaying party has to trust the ID provider. So if this ID provider is hacked, for, for example, if someone modifies the Alice's password inside the ID provider, anyone can, and, and such a person can log in as part of the authenticate himself to the uh, ID provider as Alice and then get all the access rights of Alice. Right? So essentially, we, we don't have any proof that anything like that has not happened. So how can we add proofs into the system? So we can basically overlay the system with the protocol like the site tree. So essentially, what, what would happen now is, this ID provider and this, this, this relying party would now operate on site tree. In this case, I've shown site tree as a layer that is, that is sitting below. So Alice, in the beginning of time, when she sets up an account, what happens is she contacts the ID provider, and, and the ID provider can issue this new ID for, for Alice in the system. But instead of having a separate a database of Alice's uh, properties, attributes, like what the ID provider can do is he can embed that information as part of the, 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 the Citri blockchain. So this information about Alice, her ID, her, her properties, her attributes is now embedded in this layer uh, that is now sitting below. And now Alice at some later point, uh, she, can, she can contact the, she can contact the, she can contact the, this, rela this relaying party and authenticate because she has the private key for the new ID, and then this relaying party can access all the information from this layer. So like, what's the advantage of this is now ID provider, it need not be trusted. If, if something goes wrong with the ID provider, we have exact, you can verify that something went wrong with the ID provider. These are all the rules that the ID provider uh, added to this layer, and we have, we have, we have the, the complete lineage of what happened, so you can verify that fact. So in fact, we can do something more interesting also. Uh, I won't speak a, a lot about it. It, it kind of hints at, at, at some of the ideas that we presented earlier. So in this case, all this relied party, the ID provider, Alice, if they, want to use a, if they want to use a system, essentially, if you want to get the formal guarantees that we talked about, they have to run their own Citri node. Because if they're contacting some Citri node as a service, 
so, like such a service could be lying, right? You won't get any of the guarantees. But in fact, we can get most of those guarantees by, by, by using some of the ideas that we presented earlier. I won't go into a, a lot of those details. But in principle, what you can do is we can have this verifiable caches that are sitting between this relying party and this DID or Alice and this DID system. And, and, and such a system can provide the information, but also generate a log using which you can verify that such a system is not lying. But we can talk offline if you're interested in those things. So that's a high-level view of, of what I wanted to talk about. So, but, so at this point, so, so, so let me conclude. So we, we saw that blockchains is a very interesting technology because it can give, provide proofs of transactions. Uh, and, but it, it comes with like limitations in abstractions and performance. And in particular, it, we, we, we end up uh, a lot of reinventing the wheel. And, and what we do in very, uh, the, the vision of Veritas project is, is to, is to basically combine the advantages of blockchain, but also retrofit verifiability to existing platforms uh, and overlay them on top of a blockchain so that existing applications can, so, uh, existing applications can use existing uh, systems. And we kind of illustrated many of these ideas in the context of the Citri uh, TID project. Thank you. Any questions for Armin and Donald? What happens if, uh, great presentation by the way, oh. what happens if uh, Alice loses her key? Right, uh, so I didn't talk about recovery, and in fact, that question is one of the reasons why we need to use blockchain, right? Because blockchain makes it very easy for Alice to go and say, hey, I lost the key at this point, and every transaction up to, up to a certain point is valid, and everything else was happened in terms of by an adversary. And, and so he, here's a new key for that I will be using. So essentially what I didn't speak about is like we have some uh, uh, inbuilt protocol part of the protocol where when you, when you construct a new DID, I can have a regular private key and a public key, and I keep the private key. But I also have a special key called the recovery key. And I can use, use the recovery key to show that something went wrong, and I want to basically ignore some transactions and then go forward. Right. In the bartender problem, Alice gives her key to the bartender, and he uses the ledger to uh, check the ID of Alice. Uh, what if Alice doesn't want to reveal her uh, university degree to the bartender? Right. I spoke very briefly about it. I didn't get to the details, but we can use, we can basically achieve the the same properties where Alice can verify some property with uh, with Bob, but with, without revealing anything about her other than other than the fact that that property exists. So she can prove to Bob that uh, her license mentions that her age is more than 21 without revealing any other details about her uh, when she was born, her residence, and any of those things. But it's it's like most of it. My understanding is I'm not an expert in zero knowledge proofs. My understanding is that such protocols exist. Uh, like at this point, we have we have not built any of those things, but we are aware of those possibilities. I I actually thought that Bob was directly contacted with the right. license. Yes, he, he is directly contacted. any you know, university information. So. Right, Th that is right. So yeah, so like ma like maybe my answer was more complicated than it need to be. I was talking in the context of information that is present in the license itself, okay. but yes, but any her university degree is probably is just a hash in her document. So Bob is not going to learn about it, but Bob would learn about a public key certainly. Yeah. Uh, to what degree the system can scale in terms of reads, and uh, is there any trickery in this uh, verifiable caches? Oh, verifiable caches. I didn't. I didn't get to talk much. Uh, we have a paper uh, which is the basis for some of these things. It's it appeared in last year's Sigma. Uh, it's called Concerto. So please take a look at it for verifiable caches. Uh, and uh, for the scalability of the basic system itself, we, we at this point it's we are still prototyping, but it's all open source. You can go and check out the code and play around with it. Uh, you can run your existing site tree nodes. It's all there. Uh, so. So we have not properly, pro uh, <coughs> uh, you know, we have not looked at the performance. We have not. We don't have benchmark numbers and things like that. But we have designed the system with performance in mind. So the way we do that is 
we, when we get a large number of transactions, we like uh, uh, by transactions I mean operations like new DID or update DID. We, we just put all of them. We construct a Merkle tree and we just embed the root of the Merkle tree uh, in the blockchain. So what is one one transaction in the blockchain could be hundred thousand transactions outside. Yeah, I was talking about reads mostly. So reads is basically. So reads is basically for reads you are basically running your own side tree node, right? So once you consume the information in the blockchain, you are just using a regular data structure, and in the the original proposal, like you own your node, so you can keep everything in main memory, you can serve reads, you can use the latest and best technology for it. Yeah, I, I understand you, you're only keeping hashes and not the, the actual data, but right. it's still, still read. Right? right, but once you read from the blockchain. I, I, I think it's much simpler. Yeah. The, the read is just out of a cache, and you yeah. can have as many caches as you want. Right. Yeah, so you don't have to log reads, you don't have to put reads. But that's a, a special pattern here where you don't have to log it because there's no concurrency here. Okay, thank you. So, <coughs> is there an end to end implementation in case of prototype? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's beyond a prototype, so it's uh, like it's all open source. We are kind of building the system on. With, with, with GitHub. Open ID. Oh, uh, the retrofitting the open ID is, is still conceptual, but the site tree platform itself is open source, and you can check out the code. You know, run your own site tree node. Uh, you, you probably need some bitcoins for that, but yeah. <laughs> so it's, it is expensive, but yeah. No, there, there has already been a, a big announcement with with Mastercard, and essentially, Active uh, the uh, Azure Active Directory owns this now. I mean, yeah, this has been transferred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a real. Right. This is real. Yeah. Right? This is yeah. great. Thanks again. Thank you guys.